Patrick's back. Hey, Yay. how's it going? Sleepy. Good day, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we you guys are doing remarkably well. Yes. What was that, Patrick? Uh, how are you guys doing? We're doing well. Good. So uh, we are here to talk about your ever so awesome trip to Mauna Kea and the collection of images we are working to put together. Um, I am going to uh, look to pull together the imagery um, and get that opened up if you want to overview the project. Yeah, well, uh, basically, uh, with the, uh, the introduction of Science on the Half Sphere, uh, obviously it started out with, uh, Cosmo, uh, sorry, with Cosmic Castaways uh, uh, with my colleague here, Dr. John Feldmeyer. Say hi, John. Hello. Okay. Hello. Um, yeah, and, and the idea was, uh, you know, planetaria, you know, like I said, a lot of planetaria may not have a lot of funds to keep buying a lot of these, uh, you know, well done, professionally made shows. So the idea is, well, what about content? I mean, this is one of the things that we're always talking about is content. Um, and as part of my own NSF grant for a research project that I'm heavily involved with, you know, my idea was, well, what if I were to take some images and time lapses of some of the telescopes that are used uh, in the research that I do? And then I could make those available. So in other words, you know, uh, interested people could take these full dome images, using uh, these images I take with a fisheye lens, and uh, just to make them publicly available. Uh, some of the telescopes that I use, um, some are in motion, some are just stills, and just, uh, you know, if people at other planetaria want to be able to update, you know, their images with full dome systems and show people, well, here are some of the research grade telescopes out there that people are, you know, that research scientists are using to uh, take their data. It's certainly something I use a lot in my classes. I mean, I, I go on and on in my uh, astronomy classes about telescopes. And uh, so it's like, well, what if I were to, you know, actually not just show them a flat picture on a screen, but to actually have an immersive full dome picture over an, our entire dome, and they get a feel like you know, they're in there, they're, they're actually at the telescope. And, so that and was sort of how this came from. And it's surprisingly difficult to get these images. I, I remember, I think all of us were surprised at all the hoops you had to, to jump through just to get, get pictures while you were up at Mauna Kea. Yeah, with Mauna Kea, yeah, I, had to get, I actually had to get a, a, a film license from the state of Hawaii, um, you know, stating what I was going to do. And then when going up to Mauna Kea, they really, for, for a variety of safety reasons, um, and I'm sure Nicole can relate to this, you know, when you go up that high, they don't want people just going up there alone. Yeah. You know, so they, in other words, I had to sort of talk to people at some of the observatories. Uh, fortunately, I have friends and colleagues in high places, and literally. I called in some, yeah, literally, and I, and I called in some favors, so, you know, some nights, you know, a friend of mine works at the sub-millimeter array, so one night I went up with him and took pictures and uh, some time lapses, and, you know, he was patient with me while I was taking pictures of, you know, all sorts of strange things. And, uh, and colleagues at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope and the Gemini Observatory, you know, and uh, so it sort of came to be like that. So it was a, uh, you know, last May uh, I sort of did this trip. Normally I go to Mauna Kea to collect data, but this time I was there to, you know, take pictures and, uh, you We're know, make the best a ones available. Type of data. Collecting a different type of data, yes. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, I, I really enjoy being in Mauna Kea. I think I've been up there about a dozen times now. Again, most of the time up there to collect data uh, for the various research projects that I do. But this time I, I went as photographer, or you know, photographer, and uh, you know, and had a lot of fun with it. And uh, sort of, you know, about a week and a half of going up the mountain when the conditions were right, uh, which wasn't true on some nights, and uh, and taking images and uh, sort of the Mauna Kea full dome project is sort of the culmination of that. Or at least that's the beginning of it. So I, I have, uh, let me switch screens. I have um, up on the big screen a, a picture of, can you tell us which telescope this is? Uh, I, I just have to get the monitor flipped around. I don't have uh, oh, the easy so, so. monitor access. That's OK. That's OK. John's, uh, John's I can directing. I question for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see now. So what image? Uh, oh, that one's that CFHT, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's uh, – actually, I'm glad you showed that one first because um, 
you know, they always say nice things about your first, and that was the telescope that I sort of uh, grew up using all through my graduate school days. Uh, this is a medium-sized telescope by today's standards, but it's still uh, an absolutely phenomenal telescope. Uh, uh, Canada France Hawaii telescope has been on the mountain for many decades, so it's one of the uh, it's the oldest big telescope on Mauna Kea, and uh, again, most of my graduate student research and even my current research is done using this telescope. So, you know, this would be one of the stills that I uh, took with the, uh, well, you actually, I actually see the setup right behind me here. Uh, you know, doesn't look that hard, but uh, it took quite a bit of playing around to sort of get some of these images worth showing. You're not seeing all the bad ones. And and I started with the cropped one just because it is so much easier to see the telescope. But yes. here's the full dome version of this that really lets you appreciate uh, what this lens is capable of accomplishing. Yeah, th that's what this uh, this is a uh, the, the company that makes it calls a super fisheye lens. It's got 185 degree coverage, and yeah. So basically, when this uh, this uh, this lens in particular is good for a crop sensor DSLR cameras. Um, we're using a Canon 7D here. Um, but I know Pamela's uh, has the same lens and has it on a, if I recall correctly, a T3i? Yeah, a T3i. Yeah, that was, which is also a very, very, very nice setup. So yeah, so Pamela now has the same lens as this, and this is the kind of things that you can take. Uh, this is one of the stills, this is not part of one of the time lapses. Uh, but uh, you know, again, just to give people the impression, because you know, one of the things that surprises my classes, I mean, I actually gave this lecture about a week ago for my summer class, you know, is you know, how truly big these telescopes are. I mean, people think telescope, they think of the long tube, you know, you know, pirate tube, you know, parrot on the shoulder, uh, or some of the telescopes we have at the back of the room here. But, uh, you know, they don't realize that some of these telescopes, these are gargantuan instruments, you know, multi-million dollar instruments with wonderful cameras and spectrographs, and to actually show them, you know, in the round, if you will, and it's like, wow, these things are that big, and yeah, they really are that big. I mean, they're engineering marvels, not just you know, tools for uh, we astronomers to play with. They're incredible engineering marvels. And, and you can really see, looking at this image, how it's designed to be projected up on your planetarium dome. Yes. And, and what's awesome about this imagery is it allows you to take people on a virtual tour of the globe and then to, to transition from showing them what the telescope looks like to showing them the night sky using your digital production projection system. Yeah, and, th and this is part of the idea. You know, like I said, for years, you know, I would find stock footage of observatories and put them up on the dome, uh, much like you see the logos uh, behind me here. Uh, but this way, you know, th th again, the, the whole idea, one of the advantages of having these digital full dome projectors is the immersive experience. So it's like, well, let's use this technology to, for the, to the best that we can. I mean, digital in itself doesn't always mean better, but it does give us, you know, some ways to deal with things and gives us some more opportunities. And I figure, well, nice full dome images. Now, of course, this, I, I was just starting to do telescopes because, you know, being a, an astro geek, I really like telescopes. I always have. And so for me, this was fun. But, you know, all sorts of other things can come out of this. So uh, let me switch over to another image. Um, well, I went too many. Let's, so, so this is another one of these graphically stunning images. I love the contrast of colors that you've got here. Um, so, so what system are we looking at here? Uh, I think this is the Gemini one. Gemini North. Gemini North. Yeah, yeah. This is this is. Uh, I had a chance to go, and this is a telescope that uh, has been used for some projects that I've been on, but I'd never before this trip. I'd never been able to actually go inside and have a look at it. And this is an eight meter telescope, which means the mirror that does the light collection is eight meters across. Uh, so it's a rather, you know, it's one of the largest telescopes in the world. And, and for those of you who don't speak metric, uh, this is about 25 feet across. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, my Canadian heritage. All right. <laughs> yes. Um, and so this is another, you know, fantastic telescope. I had a chance to go up there a couple of days and take some shots inside and uh, was uh, and with the, with the camera I was able to experiment I mean I'm not a uh, I'm not a professional photographer I'm a, I'm a you know I'm, a, I'm an astronomer who likes photography so I'm, I'm trying all sorts of new things I did lots of learning on the mountain on this trip 
uh, including how to take um, bracketed exposures and then combine them to create what's uh, called an HDR image or high dynamic range. So the image that you're seeing here is actually a combination of three different images. Uh, a normal exposure, a slightly underexposed, and a slightly overexposed image. And then combine so that you can see, so that the shadows are not completely black, you can actually see some details in them, and the really bright areas are not saturated. So it's sort of like a best of all worlds uh, in shots like this. And, and I have to admit, HDR photography is something I still haven't gotten right. And... Um, well, the Kudos thing is, figuring it out. Well, actually, the the thing is, is uh, I mean, part of it, part of the, I learned this is the the people who developed, who basically came up with this system for us, are the nice guys over at Dome Three D. Uh, so a nice shout out to them because they actually came out with the camera setup, saying this is our custom setup for you. They showed me how to do it and taught me how to do this. The thing about HDR imagery is that if you've got a camera like the like uh, your camera, Pamela, and, and ours. You can take bracketed exposures off a few stops, and and then you can actually. There's some actually cheap software. You don't need to be a Photoshop guru, and I'm not. Um, I keep hoping I will be someday, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, there are some you know low cost software there where you can just drag in three raw images, combine them, and within 30 seconds you've got an HDR image. And actually, that Gemini shot is one of those. It it really looks awesome. Um, I, inevitably, whenever I try and do HDR, something happens so that the images don't line up, or I just can't. I'm still figuring it out. Well, that's the thing. If anything moves in the image, it, it, it doesn't really work. I was dealing with static images. All of my time lapses were not done in that way. This is just for the still images. And, and I think my problem is I'm always outside, and uh, there's a lot more movement going on when you're not yeah, inside when, of a building. That's right, and this is really difficult to do in those cases. I'd love to be able to do it, but no, I haven't tackled that yet either. And uh, so it's, it's, it's really a nice thing. It's, it, it sort of came out really nicely. And like I said, this is just me experimenting around. I mean, uh, any of the photographers who are watching this right now might be looking at the image going, wait a minute, what, did he really do that? Oh, come on, you know, that's, I'm learning, and this is one of the things. Like I said, you know, it's, uh, it's not even part of my day job. It's one of the fun things I get to do, and uh, I enjoy it. It's uh, so it's neat. But like I said, you're not seeing the pictures, you know, that didn't work out. I mean, this is a, this is sort of the setup of how I would take that very picture that you're seeing. You know, uh, I've got a fisheye lens pointed straight up. Now you can't hide from a fisheye lens. What you're not seeing are the pictures where there's a picture of a telescope, and then at the very back there's the top of my head. <laughs> it's I the, the, the times I've used my fisheye lens. I think I've really worried the people around me because I've ended up like crouching as tiny as I can directly underneath the camera, trying desperately to get out of its field of view. And what's oh. really funny is watching other people think that they're backing out of the field of view now. Yes. No, and, and, and some again some of my pictures. I mean even my time lapses. I have also time lapse imagery videos of. Uh, of this particular telescope, and in those ones, you know, I, they were moving the telescope for me, but the, the people were there working the telescope to check it out for that night. So I've got people walking in and through, and uh, so yeah, fisheye lens really can't, yeah, you can't really hide from it. Like I said, no. you don't have any of the pictures where this big telescope on one side, and on the other side there's this head, you know, the <laughs> you know, very top of my head, um, which are striking, but they're not part of CosmoQuest. <laughs> so, <laughs> Unless we get the gag reel. So, uh, Guido Bibra, whose name I'm sure I just destroyed, I'm so sorry, um, he said, and plus 10,000 for HDR. It's not hard, Pamela. I've also been doing it for years, and I'm, on and I'm only using an older Canon bridge camera. Same goes to basic astrophotography. Doesn't actually need the most expensive gear. No, you don't need expensive gear. No. You do need the world to stand still, which is where I run into problems. Yeah, you need the world to stand still, and like I said, I mean, this particular lens that we have is, uh, is fixed aperture, fixed focus, so we don't have to do a lot of screwing around. So in other words, for someone like me who's getting into it, there's fewer things to go wrong. And uh, yeah, and I mean, the program I use, it's called HDR TIST Pro. It's, yeah, uh, that's I, the one I use as well. That's use, yeah. You can just drag three pictures in. It's just like drag and drop. Take three images as long as they're all lined up. And in 30 seconds, on my laptop at least, you've got yourself an HDR image. You can do some tweaking. And uh, and you're and you're good to go. 
So it's a, it's a lot of fun. And so, I also learn stuff from the students too. You know. um, so Morgan, um, Morgan Gordon uh, on YouTube asks uh, or says, searching for super fisheye lens returned numerous disparate lenses. What lens is being used? Is it a Canon fisheye or a third party lens? It third is party. a third party. Yeah, it's called Sun X. It's a, it's a basic lens. It's also one of the more basic fish eyes. Uh, the thing about this lens, it's a 5.6 millimeter, but it's specifically for crop sensor cameras. So if you've got a full frame DSLR, this isn't going to be the camera for you. And the idea is that the whole image fits onto the rectangular uh, chip. So it actually fits for this particular series of cameras. I know it works well for the Canons. Uh, I don't know exactly how it looks on the Nikons, but uh, yeah, yeah. So the, it's kind of limited, but it's 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 a basic lens. It's not as expensive as the Canon ones, but and but this camera is because it's simplified. Like I said, you don't have to worry about focusing or aperture, so there are limitations to what things you can do. Um, and you can take it to fourteen thousand. Yeah, and you and it's easy to take at fourteen thousand feet. Uh, yeah, it just the the image just barely fits on the chip for the T three I. That's right. And the same for all the other ones. Uh, the, the same thing of that ilk: the T4i, the T5, uh, the Canon 7D. I mean, we got a we got a nice rugged camera. Uh, this was partially purchased out of my NSF grant, but also a donation to our planetarium uh, as well. So this is why we have this equipment in the first place. But uh, the 7D is a nice rugged lens. It's uh, you know it takes a lot of takes a lot of abuse, which is kind of a good thing because when you're like I said, at seven, sorry, at fourteen thousand feet, you know, you're sometimes in, uh, digging in the lava rock. Um, and Pamela brought up something nicely, which is, you know, the whole idea is, you know, uh, I don't know if people can see the camera set up here, but the whole idea is, yeah, you've got to duck down kind of like this, you know, to take pictures. And there were a couple of days where it was forty mile an hour, fifty mile an hour winds. So, you know, I just there are these people who are probably watching. Who is this guy? He's got this camera and he's hugging his tripod so that it's not moving. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of that, but that would have been something to see. It's in those moments that you begin to understand why tripods have the hook on the inside in the center so that you can hang sandbags or ankle weights to. to yeah stabilize them. That, that was something that always confused me because it seemed like a really stupid place to put a hook until the first time I was dealing with wind. Yeah, until you're dealing with wind. I mean, one I took one sequence on the summit. So uh, one night it was nice and clear. So I was outside the Canada France Hawaii telescope and we had 40 mile an hour winds up there and it's pretty cold. So I wasn't going to stay out there. And so I did a series of 30 second shots for three hours. So I basically set up the camera, put some heavy weights, hunkered it down, started taking pictures, went inside the telescope, got something to eat, uh, and then came out going, well, I hope this worked. <laughs> and, and I think I'm showing one of those, those pictures now. Um, yeah, is it the time lapse with all the streaks in it? Uh, no, this is a single frame. Oh, this is a single frame, yeah. This one, uh, I, I can't remember if this one I took either, I either took it at the visitor center at 9,000 feet or from the summit at 14, but yeah, this would be one of those pictures that yes, that's just a 30 second exposure. I really ramped up the noise to make that image work. But yes, I can. I think this may be one of the pictures where yes, I'm literally cradling the tripod and <laughs> and hoping it works. So yeah, so like I said, as any photographer will tell you, a real photographer will tell you, um, there's a lot of experimentation. Like I said, uh, you know, the images that Pamela are showing are the ones that I went, okay, that one, that one's not so bad. And, and the lens that, that Dusty just shared on the event page, that is the correct lens. And, okay. um, yeah, you can do amazing things with this. And I do have the time-lapse video that you took. Let me cue that up for a moment. Okay. And, and so what, what are the types of images that you are working to, to collect? How do you mean? I mean, the, 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 I mean... So, so I know like me? one of the things that's on my list of things to do, and I'm paranoid about dew and clouds and things, is once we hit drought season here in Illinois, um, I want to do a sunrise out at the barn that goes from uh, pre-twilight all the way to the point that they've taken all of the horses out to pasture, just to get that whole um, cornfield, horses, dark skies, except for the oil refinery on the horizon. 
um, and and just see what it really looks like because I think that would make a really neat transition into a planetarium show um, or out of a planetarium show, I guess, as the case may be. Well, what what are some of the, the scenes that you want to get that you can have as stock footage to use for the shows that you're creating? Oh, boy. Uh, I mean, I always try and get, I mean, this first part of the project was get telescopes in motion, try and get some just before sunset into evening shots, the, the full transition to go from really dark, however, to really bright is, is rather difficult because the idea of a time lapse is you just keep shooting the same uh, exposure time and obviously you would need to change it for those. So I haven't, that's one thing I haven't mastered um, is being able to do the transitions. They've helped a little bit, um, you know, uh, They've helped a little bit. I had actually had uh, some of my uh, shots inside the Gemini telescope as it was transitioning from uh, into twilight. Where actually uh, I had hired a uh, YSU photography student to help me a little bit, and uh, she kind of uh, worked uh, worked on them a little bit. So she had the photo Photoshop, uh, you know, mojo, if you will, to sort well, of help I, me I out, you know. I have to ask: Have you jailbroke your camera yet and installed uh, Magic Lantern? No, I haven't yet. I have not done that. Uh, like I said, I'm I'm still uh, you know uh, I'm still doing baby steps. So I know. I have to admit my um, remote for my camera, my intervalometer, it died a brutal death at however many ten thousand feet at sixteen thousand feet with Nicole and. Oh, um, having bought one, I didn't feel like buying another, so I jailbroke my camera, installed Magic Lantern, and it it allows me to to do the intervalometry where I set the camera to take a shot of whatever length is required to get a sufficient exposure, um, but the time lapse is made of images all taken at the same distance between start times on the, the images. So it's led to some really neat time-lapse photography that is automatically compensating for the variations in light. Wow, okay. See, that, that's something I haven't been able to try and work successfully. I mean, uh, you know, truth be told, uh, uh, Nicole, I really want to see those images at some point. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious to see how those, how those worked out. Um, so let's take a look at the time-lapse that you took in the dome. Okay. Yeah, this is yeah, this is just a, a time lapse of the Gemini telescope uh, itself, and again, it's one of those things where you know we set up maybe forty feet feet from uh, the pier and uh, you know just standing underneath this gargantuan telescope and uh, letting shots go. And I, I basically I use the intervalometer and just let it fire away as quickly as I can. So yeah, that's probably a, a couple of minutes. Uh, of, of actual motion, and but the time lapse itself is about, I think, about 10 seconds long. And, so. and what, what amuses me to no end on this is uh, towards the beginning, the, the long arms on the, the tube of the telescope appear to twist as they're getting distorted through the center of the image and that's just a really neat effect. Yeah, it's a really neat effect and it, and, it works, and it works even better when it's projected up on the dome. Because then uh, it's not bent, it's just actually projected the way it should be. It's projected the way it should be. I mean that's the thing about full dome is you know even with fisheye lenses you know with the, uh, the equipment which is well, hidden behind me on the white card but uh, you know, with a full dome projector, it's not like you can just take a regular DVD, project it through, and expect it to look good. Things have to be warped in the right way before you can, uh, you know, use it in these systems. But with the fisheye lens, it's, you know, it, it's going to sound weird, but pre-warped. So basically, the images are ready to go. So in other words, these, uh, you, show, you showed a couple of the images already. I mean, basically, someone could take that image, put it into whatever their uh, digital full dome system is, and just project it right up there right away. So it's... Really, they are really just ready to go. And Sylvan West, Sylvan Westby is saying, "I love my f one point seven fifty millimeter lens. This is a very fast lens. Fraser and I both have one. I think Fraser's is actually an insane one point four. 
Yeah, the um, 1.4 is the yeah, better lens, yeah. Yeah, um, I have the 1.7. And these are lenses that you can go to a, a dinner party where there's just really not enough light. And normally when you take a picture, everyone appears a little bit too red. And the blacks are filled with all of that strange little spar uh, strange little um, overexposure noise or in some cases just dark current in the CCD. Well, with the 50 millimeter lens, it's just fine. It's like you're shooting in normal daylight. You can get amazing photos just sitting out on the sidewalk, eating in the evening, just under the street lights, and you'd never know it was nighttime. Uh, so that's that's a really fast lens. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a nice one as well. Yeah, I wish I had one of those myself. Uh, the, like I said, the, I guess the one unfortunate thing with the, the, the fisheye that we have is it's a fixed aperture f5.6, so it's not the fastest lens. Yeah. So, for example, you showed the picture of the stars from Mauna Kea. I had to bump up the ISO to make that one work in 30 seconds because after about that time, you know, on the very edge, even on the fisheye, you start to see the trailing of the stars. Yeah, well, uh, the, the you know. limitation with the 55 millimeter is you have to, it feels like you have to back up forever to get things in your field of view. So, what you trade off to get the giant field of view or in other cases to get a giant zoom, um, it, it can't do those things, but it sure can gather light. Yeah, well, that's the thing about crop sensor cameras, though, is that uh, you know when you buy a lens and you have to multiply it by a, a factor of about sixty percent, at least on the Canon lenses. So you know when you have a fifty millimeter lens on a on a, a camera like what we have and what you have, you know it's really acting like an eighty millimeter lens uh, for those people who go back to the the film days of SLR cameras. So, you know, that's the one thing. For telephoto, it works in your, to your advantage, but for fisheye, it doesn't. So that's why we need these, you know, on these types of cameras, you need this sort of super fisheye lens. So um, that's why there's not too many lenses for these cameras where you get the full 180 degrees. And we're working to take all of these images and collect them together over on CosmoQuest. Yes. And, and this is something um, we're... I think we're both having stupid amounts of fun doing this. To be entirely well, honest, but but I think that's but that's the that's the beauty of it. I mean, this is it's not like oh here's a here's a chore and you go take images. This no, it, it no, comes about from all the fun. I mean, this is why I talked to my friends and said, oh, can I come up and and you know take some images of the telescope? You know, get the appropriate permissions and do that. It's a lot of fun. And yeah, I mean, the, the hope is within about the next week here, we're going to have. Uh, about 60 stills and a various series of time lapses all up on the CosmoQuest site because that'll be the place to to get all of these. So Planetaria, if you want images of telescopes uh, of some of the research telescopes that we use, go ahead. They're free, Creative Commons license. Uh, you know, you know, free for non-commercial work, and then people can just use these in their show if they want to show a picture of the Gemini North Observatory, the Gemini North Telescope. You know, we've got one right there and. You know, the plan is to do more of these. Um, I mean, I'm actually, uh, sometime this summer, I'm going to go down the road to Allegheny Observatory. They've got a classical 30-inch refractor, and, uh, you know, they, they've expressed interest in me coming down and doing some time lapses of their telescope. Uh, and I, I don't think I've had a chance to tell you yet, but uh, when I go to the Global Hands-On Universe meeting in Greece, um, it's north of Athens, and on the way back, I'm going to overnight in Athens before taking my morning flight uh, back to the United States, and I'm going to do my hand, uh, try my hand at getting uh, some pictures of the Parthenon and some of the other amazing uh, locations that, that are there in Athens that I've seen of uh, folks on the World at Night website taking amazing photos of. Um, no promises, but this is one of those things I'm going to try to do. Uh, it's one of those things you try to do. I mean, it's you, you take, like I said, my first few pictures with this camera set up, you know, one worked well and it actually ended up in the Cosmic Castaway show. So thanks, John, who's, uh, who's, who's producing, by the way. Um, and, you know, sort of learn from there. Try this. Oh, I would like to have done that better and uh, take the best we can. I mean, I've even been talking with the people at NRAO to try and do this with the Green Bank Telescope. Oh, wow. It's just a lot. It's a lot harder there, though, because the uh, with a single dish telescope, the uh, uh, radio frequency interference is from digital SLR cameras is rather a problem. <laughs> 
You managed so, to get Nicole back. She's prairie dogging into the hangout, having heard the magic word Green Bank. She heard the magic word GBT. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm hoping to get some stills at some point, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things that they're keen on me doing it, but the, the, the hard part is how to physically take digital pictures, you know, especially the telescope in motion. So, but I've, I've been in talks to do that as well because, again, uh, and with all apologies to Nicole, I don't do radio astronomy, I'm sorry. Um, but they do have maintenance periods. On the but they do have maintenance periods, yeah. Well, they have one, but the... Several telescopes on site, you have to catch a maintenance period for all the telescopes. Have you yeah, that's, and that's the hard yeah. part, so... You do surveying at the site, yeah, you got to catch that small window. So... Um, good, I'm glad yeah. to hear you're working on that. Yes, I am working on that. Matter of fact, I, I was exchanging emails just last week to see, because I'm actually going to be in Charlottesville in, uh, in two weeks to go to a meeting, and I thought, well, on my drive back from Charlottesville to Youngstown, I can stop at NRAO and... Absolutely. See if I get see if I get a few chances. So who knows? Uh, may get some shots. But again, so these are this is kind of like the beginning. This uh, this Mauna Kea thing is just the beginning of. Hey, this is kind of cool because I use telescopes on Mauna Kea, uh, in particular Canada France Hawaii telescope to to collect data that I use. But it's like that's become more of a oh let's take just try this telescope. Let's see what I can get with this, and it, it sort of turned into a lot of fun. And so, so just to, to pause for the sta station identification, um, for those of you tuning in for the amazing images right now, you have wandered into the CosmoQuest 24-hour hangout that's actually going to last for 32 hours because uh, we're moving so fast we dilated time. Well, um, either that or we're on the extended mission. <laughs> We're on the extended this, mission. We, we, yeah, uh, we've got past the 24 hours. We actually hours. are in the extended we mission. We are in the extended point. mission as of this hour. That's right. Um, so, uh, the the science on the half sphere is just one of the many examples of things that we do, partnering with other institutions, other programs, trying to find ways to. Uh, stretch what we're able to do, trying to take advantage of the technology we've already developed to create what we can for free, to build um, as many things as we can to enable people to engage in science, engage in science imagery, and to build a community around, uh, around science. And uh, we are here uh, talking to you live for 32 hours. Um, to try and raise money to keep our programs going well into the future. Um, we're currently facing a variety of, of governmental funding cuts where some of the grants we'd normally go after simply went away, where we're looking at sequestration cuts, we're looking at uh, potentially the federal government reorganizing how science is taught in America. Um, and we're trying to protect ourselves against all of these changes by um, our goal was to try and raise six months worth of funding. We recognized going into this, this might be an impossible goal, um, but we're raising as much as we can and we will keep trying to raise money beyond this weekend. Um, and, and we just want to enable as many people to engage in doing and learning science as we can. Uh, so we partner with planetariums to create free content that they can they can send out to their audiences. And I know out at Youngstown State, the Ward Beecher Planetarium, they don't charge any admission. Uh, people can just show up, take in the science, and enjoy an air-conditioned evening on a summer night. Um, we collect these images to be used as stock photography in new uh, planetarium shows being created anywhere in the world. And this is just one part of our mission. And uh, we'd ask for you to please consider donating to allow us to keep doing all of these things. Uh, you can donate at cosmoquest.org slash donate. Um, and to, to give you some perspective on this kind of stuff, I know like my camera body that I use for this, it's my personal yeah. camera body. And so while the fisheye lens I have is one that was uh, bought on year-end spend-out funds that we had last year, um, we, we do everything we can to extend what we have, even at the cost of sometimes saying, okay, what I own personally is going to work for this, so I'm just going to use it. Um, so please help, and we will keep doing all we can to keep bringing you the science. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I actually went out and uh, I basically did what Pamela did, is I went out and, you know, I now have my own digital SLR, which can also make use of this fish eye lens and, uh, and continue to, to play more with it. 
just out of curiosity, did you guys ever get the uh, the, uh, the the three minute video that uh, we made? Uh, Which three minute late. video? It's uh, the Mauna Kea flat or something. Yes. Uh, yes. Hold on. It's, it's on one of the drives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All the drives. Whee. Yeah. It's it, it's sort of a montage of some of the other images as well as some of the non full dome images uh, of the telescopes because. Uh, you know, with these cameras, of course, not everything is going to be fisheye. I'm always out there with the regular lenses and taking some shots, and there's a few in there as well. But it just goes with the fun. Like I said, uh, uh, I'm an astronomer who gets to play photographer and take pictures of things that uh, interest me, and uh, hopefully they can be of use to other people. Like I said, it's, uh, you know, uh, it shouldn't just be Mauna Kea, but it, that was the sort of start when it came to my, uh, to my NSF grant, so this is where, you know, all of this came from. The, the Mauna Kea image is showing up as damaged. Oh, okay. So we'll work to get that fixed and get that posted online for you to view later. We're very sorry. Okay. Well, we did, um, we have, I, we, there was a link to a YouTube video. And, and, let me uh, see if I can find that. Yeah. Is it on the Ward Beecher uh, YouTube channel? Yeah, it's on the Ward Beecher YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, so we have a comment from Graham Stickings uh, saying it would be nice to see time lapse of the VLA all moving together. And I know uh, photographer Tom Lowe, I think, uh, oh my gosh, he contacted me a couple years ago uh, to get out to the VLA and I, I passed along a contact and I think that worked out. Um, so there's been some really great time lapse uh, video of the VLA. Uh, the the uh, the thing with the very large array is that they're not as strict with um, with RFI requirements because uh, an interferometer can filter those things out a little bit better than a single dish can. Right. So next time you're out in New Mexico. <laughs> oh, I I want to. I mean, this is the thing. The thing is now is when I go places. I mean, I was actually back in Hawaii again last September for a meeting, and I thought, well, I'm going to take the equipment with me, so if I get a chance to take some more pictures, and uh, and I did that. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of those things. It's like, well, when the opportunity presents itself, take some more images, see how well they are, and if they're if I feel they're, you know, they're going to be useful for other other planetaria to use, or if people just, you know, anybody wants to look at, you know, uh, fisheye images of, of some of these things, they can just go ahead and do so, you know. And uh, I'll make sure to get my Alma set to to Pamela. So, uh, so yeah. I, I took a lot of pictures. And Alma's got to be that's got to be a fantastic there's something good in it. I don't there's got to be there's got to be something good in it. <laughs> But, uh, but, but yeah, but well, while things are being checked on, I mean, I think another thing, and this is sort of what I've been taking out of seeing various parts of the Hangout so far is, you know, this whole idea, it's all about people. I mean, we can talk about the images and the equipment that we have, but it's, it's all about the people doing it, whether it's the, uh, the, the staff we have here and the students here, or, you know, helping with creating shows or all, everybody over at CosmoQuest. I mean, it's all about people doing all these things and, uh, and people having fun. At least that's the hope. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we do what we do because we love it, uh, yes. not because we love fighting with corrupted files on hard drives. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there's 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 a case in point. Um, I mean, yesterday we had a, you know someone brought in a nice question about digital versus. Oh, I mean. Well, it, is somebody typing on his computer? You suddenly we're losing went, your audio. You're losing my audio. Oh. Yeah. It's yeah. it's muting. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Is that better? I think so. Go ahead, give it a try. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, the whole idea is that uh, you know it's 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 still the person behind the planetarium that gives the show and uh, you know you know introduces people to astronomy. And I think that's one of the key things. We just want to provide tools, and again, in this case, images that people can go ahead and you know talk more about telescopes. In this case, to to everybody. So it's a uh, Again, it's all fun for me, and uh, judging from Pamela's pictures, fun for her too, right? Yeah. So, yeah, no, it, it's a real passion for me, and, and I have to yeah. admit defeat on finding this video. It doesn't seem to be public on your YouTube channel. It, it's private, yeah. We sent a link, I think, through the email. We have thousands of emails. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> on this event alone. Um, okay. But we will make sure that that gets out so that you yeah. can all enjoy it later. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and, all the uh, and, and some of the images that you've seen already are will be up on CosmoQuest uh, public within about a week. However, just, um, we did just get a link to more of the puppet endorsement videos, which I just sent to you via Hangout, um, <laughs> which has nothing to do with this topic. But if you want to throw some in, they're Dropbox links to, to pop in later. 
uh, we can do that in between segments. <laughs> cool. From the Hangout link, yeah. Uh, oh, we have, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so really, yeah, it's really, this project is, like I said, um, you know, along with Cosmic Castaways and the Mauna Kea image, this is, this is just the beginning. You know, we want to move forward and do other things, just like with, you know, with Cosmic Castaways, we want to do more shows that people can get, a, you know, have for free. We also want to do the same thing with images, so, you know, that's why when I heard Nicole was going to uh, Alma, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> this is she did. Shiny. Well, actually, she said. Well, I first said no because I had a, a CosmoQuest commitment, and I told Pamela, and she goes, "No, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll let you out of it and take my yeah. camera." Yeah, yeah it was one of these things. We were going to South by Southwest, and yes. Alma trumped South by Southwest. Yeah. I would have loved to have been there myself. I I would have loved it. So. I know we're having Matt Kaplan on, not in the next segment, but the segment after, and so we can talk a little bit about our uh, traipsing throughout the desert. <laughs> oh, okay. Together. Yeah, oh, he neat. was uh, one, of the, uh, one of the other U.S. journalists. Do we have a video? I'm Apollo, and I approve this science. <laughs> <laughs> it never gets old. <laughs> <laughs> huh? I'm Apollo. Hello, and I approve this science. <laughs> well, that's what we stand up and say, science! Science! <laughs> science! science. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, it's we do what we do because we love it. And I'm, I'm currently having a moment of the one bitterness we're allowed as optical astronomers. We had all this observing scheduled last night where I was going to do astrophotography with everyone, and it poured. And oh. now it's beautifully sunny outside. Oh, my oh, goodness. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's unfortunate. Yeah, that's that's the other thing to try. We uh, we always try to get across to our students, both John and I. You know, it's uh, yeah, when it's really cloudy out, an eight meter telescope is about the same as a twelve inch telescope. Uh, you know, you might as well just sit back and have some hot chocolate or. Also, take advantage of the clear nights at the beginning of the semester. Don't wait till the end of the yes. semester. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we we fall into that trap as well. Oh yes. <laughs> I'll, although I have to admit, uh, the one excuse I had for getting out of attending Calculus 3 and Calculus 4, is actually Calculus 4, uh, as an undergrad, was it was a night class the same semester as taking Observational Astronomy Lab. And while Observational Astronomy was only supposed to be Tuesday nights, if it got clouded out on Tuesday, we needed to go to the Dome on Monday or Wednesday. So I managed to get out of a few calculus lectures. Um, I learned better from the book for calculus, um, and uh, go out and spend time at the dome instead. I was a bad student in a very good way. Okay. We didn't get out of our, our classes. The, the one semester I did do optical observing, uh, I remember showing up to physics the next day, because physics and astronomy were separate departments at UVA, and uh, yeah, just yeah. like this, no sleep, kind of dragged in, and oh, one of my friends, I won't name him, <laughs> just... <laughs> Falls asleep and then he wakes up and and he wakes up and says not quietly, is he still talking? <laughs> In the middle of lecture, and wow. all the physics majors turn around to stare at us, those bad astronomers in the back of the room. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my God. <laughs> Well, that, that's, that's the thing. Some people think that astronomers are always on the night shift, and we're not always, but we do go observing. Yeah, we, have to, we do have to shift to you know, being up all night and sleeping during the day, and uh, you know, all sorts of interesting things can happen as a result. That is uh, entirely true. Yeah, it is. Uh, I've been on observing rooms with John. Yeah. I've been observing rooms with John, and it's like, okay, John, i got to crash in the couch. He's taking data, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, just make the best out of it. Or the one night that the, the telescope um, uh, wasn't tracking quite right, so we actually had to use a joystick to, to guide. Oh, God. We actually had to do that, and that was like, you know, so it's kind of funny. So, you know, John's controlling the exposure. I'm sitting here going, okay, i got to keep this thing centered in the... <laughs> oh, yeah, you get all sorts of fun things. And, and, oh, and like I said, you're, running, you're doing it this 2, 2.30 in the morning. It's kind of fun, maybe. Maybe. It's fun yeah. to talk about it now. 
I, I got some of the best tweets from my friend Rachel uh, when she was uh, observing in Arizona. Uh, I knew when it'd be getting to the wee hours of the morning for her in Arizona. I was still up in the department working in Virginia. <laughs> and that was just when, oh, uh, uh, when the best tweets would come out. And, and I would just be hysterical laughing <laughs> at them. Yeah, and well. and I, I have to admit, when I was a, a grad student doing observational astronomy, it wasn't until my last couple of years that uh, AOL Instant Messenger finally started to exist. We were occasionally using the old Unix talk protocols before then, but when you were out observing, you were isolated, and the machine that we used to control the 30-inch um, if you tried to open, this was the days of Netscape, if you tried to open Netscape, it would crash X windows so you couldn't oh, observe geez. and open a web browser oh, okay. at the same time. Okay, yes. Yeah. No, it's, it's one of those things, it's like, you know, it's not always uh, a perfect up there. I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, even at 14,000 feet, you can still observe all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And I'm not talking just about the observers at the telescopes, you know, it's, uh, it can be rather interesting. My first run on the on that Canada France Hawaii telescope was in 1992, and I was outside taking pictures. So you know my interest in photography goes back quite a ways. And just before the sun goes down, someone pulls up in a four by four and says, "Excuse me, you know where I can buy any film around here?" And I looked yeah. at him. And I said, um, "There's a photo mat about an hour and a half down the mountain." <laughs> He said, oh, and I went into the telescope. This is back in the film days, and I went in, and I, I sold him a roll of film for $10. And I could have gotten more, because if, if you're at the top of an extinct volcano looking for film, you know, so, yeah, so even at the top of a mountain, yes, even if you're at the top of a mountain, you can still see, you know, interesting things going on. So many stories from Mauna Kea, the person driving down the dirt road in a Chevy Aveo. Um, you know, big sign says four by four is only beyond this point, and someone's you know going up there with a Chevy Aveo. I mean, it's uh, oh yeah, you get all sorts of things now. Well, one of my one of the things my friend uh, was uh, trying to get me to buy um, a, a car. She says you need all wheel drive. I said why? She says you're an astronomer, right? Don't you drive up and down all those mountain roads? I was like, oh yeah, that's probably a good yeah, idea. Yeah, this is why I own a Jeep Wrangler instead of a Honda Accord. Yeah, I'm glad I got my Subaru <laughs> instead of a yeah. Honda as well. <laughs> so I am going to take a sleepy person prerogative and um, share what I'd hoped that we'd be able to create part of last night with some of our observing. This is something that I took um, about a year ago uh, from my attic window. Oh, really? Mm hmm I love is you can tell when cars drive by in the background. Yeah, well, that yeah, that certainly happened a lot in mine, in my videos as well. Some of my time lapses, you can see all the cars leaving the mountain because, uh, you know. So this this is we went uh, an entire course of the night with a set of images. Um, I went from sunset through sunrise, showing the transitions through twilight, and how it never truly gets dark. And I live in a town of 25,000, surrounded by corn. And she laughs because it's true. And the fact that we can live in a fairly dark part of the country, and it still never gets entirely dark. Um, it's just one of those things that really makes you wake up and realize we need to change our lighting and change how we use light in the night. 
and that's my neighbor's roof. <laughs> Out the well, window, that, right but, there. Yeah, but that's that. That uh, first of all, those are absolutely beautiful shots. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's one of the things I appreciate. Like I said, when you go outside, you know, in Mauna Kea, where it's very, very dark, and you just look at the sky, and uh, you know, I've taken some pictures with the fisheye in less than optimal conditions, and it doesn't take long before you really notice all that light. I mean, it's one of those uh, things you get a chance to do, and I wish more people had a chance to do it. Uh, see a nice dark sky. I mean, every year I ask all my students in our astronomy classes, you know, how many of you have seen the sky from a dark, dark place? Usually 10 or 15 percent. Wow. Yeah. So we'd so, love to, I'd love to change that, you know. We're, we're getting some really nice questions in. We have uh, W. Donahue on Twitter is asking... Oh. <laughs> suggestions for online resources for digital astrophoto post-processing. Uh, I have photo CS6 extended. I, I have to admit I use uh, Photoshop 6 as well. Um, if you want to stack images, Registack is pretty good. Uh, if you want to do HDR, uh, you can pronounce it better. I always end up saying HD Trist something or other. So, so what's the name of the HDR software we use, Patrick? Uh, uh, HD Artist Pro. So, it's, you know, so spell it H D R T I S T and then Pro. So HD Artist. I would never have gotten that. Yeah. So that's that. Yeah, and it's incomprehensible set of letters. Like I said, I mean, I'm sure that, and I'm sure that your Photoshop CS6 viewers are going, why would you do something like that? Well, like I said, as as I, I'm sure, hopefully people are getting it. Is there's a lot of there's a lot of things I wish I knew how to do, and Photoshop is one of them. It's one of the reasons why I, you know, um, some of the, some of the work has been helped by Kurt Spivey, our engineer, and a student that I hired because they know Photoshop very well, and I wish I knew it better than others. So, so I kind of use these quick and dirty things, but it's it's a way to get into the game. And, and over on the event page, Jeff Borst is asking, is that your husband, Pamela, on guitar? No. Uh, I, I like all the good folks over at uh, uh, YSU. Uh, go to Imcomptech to get uh, free-to-use software. Um, it, it's a great source of podcast-free music, uh, also YouTube-free music. Um, then we also, I see Matthew Wood is uh, asking, but I need to lean over, do you have any suggestions for folks that are interested in getting into science with writing, blogging, advocacy, baking? <laughs> you want to do what we do? Don't bake the way I did. Those were monstrosities. They tasted really good, though. They did taste good. They just looked like monstrosities. I'm... I'm I was a little scared looking at that picture, Pamela. Yeah, I was... I, I'm going to have to redo that to, like, rescue my honor in the kitchen. <laughs> uh, after one of the earlier segments, I'm still thinking of going out and getting some Oreos. Yeah, so. we're, we're, we're pro Oreo. Oh, here. yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. The, the, Ore the Oreo geology is the way to go. Yeah. Um, so I'm noticing it's 12.09. Do we have uh, folks in the green room? Fraser's the next one. So I, I told Tim to take a nap since Fraser knows what's, what he's doing. So, so we all need a green room. <laughs> we, we also have a guest from the uh, National Science uh uh, National Center for Science Education for Astronomy Cast. Mm -hmm. I don't know who that is. I didn't get any info. Oh, crud. <laughs> that would be a Pamela mistake. Um, okay, let me look up that information, get it to you, and I have to admit, I, I need to do a potty break before we... <laughs> Things so, so to answer this question, uh, we don't have any suggestions. Just do fun stuff. <laughs> well, actually, since Fraser's in here, I think Fraser's the right person to ask this. And when I saw that question, that's why I was asking about the green room. Okay. Um, yeah, I only saw Fraser on the schedule, so I told him to take a nap. Yeah, that <laughs> I think I must have uh, made a mistake. Um, let me well, look I, that up. I, let me do a call out and say hi to Fraser. I've not met Fraser, but uh, I'm from Vancouver Island, so... Where on Vancouver Island? Island? From, I'm but not on. Yeah, I'm not on anymore. I, I used to live in Shemanus. Oh, sure. I went, and I went and I lived in Victoria for many years. So I am, I'm, I'm in Courtney. You're in Courtney, yeah. I lived yeah. in Nanaimo, Nanaimo uh, Shemanus, and Victoria. Yeah. So, and my mom still lives in Nanus. Yeah, I actually grew up on Hornby Island. 
Hornby Island, very nice. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you, you, you guys are from Canada. You know each other, right? Yeah, yeah of course. course. Going in. <laughs> so, because okay. there's ten of you. That's, That's good. I wanted the chance to say hi to Fraser. So, <laughs> great, to, great to meet you. So I'm going to ask you guys to vamp for a couple of minutes. Um, we are waiting for a guest, Minda from the National Center for Science Education. We are going to be doing a show on. I'm going to have to set up a different mic. I, oh. I just need to be back in a moment. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? I'm going to answer that question that yes. that you just got about how people can get into the blogging, reporting. I don't know about baking for science, but I can definitely help out with the blogging. So, um, you know, the internet has changed everything, and so now we've got this situation where anyone who wants, who's got, you know, the the interest in writing and taking photographs, there's a ton of ways that you can do it. You can post, you start your own blog, you know, write articles, post things to social media like Google Plus and Facebook and you know, do short stuff on Twitter. There's there's no shortage of outlets. And there's also, you know, more, I don't know if you would call it legitimate, but but sort of other entities like like my own universe today that, you know, we hire writers all the time. And uh, all we care about is how well you write and how well you report and how good your ideas are. And so, you know, if you have any interest at all in becoming a journalist and becoming a writer, any of that, my, you know, my recommendation is number one, Start finding interesting and unique stories that nobody else has has written about, and start posting them onto your own blog. You know, the more you can get away from what the crowd is doing. You know, don't just report on the the press releases that everybody is reporting on. Actually, look for original stories, and they're all out there. I mean, in many cases, if you look at like um, Astro PH, like Archive, there's a a hundred new interesting pieces of research reported every single day. None of them get reported on. Um, you know, if you look in YouTube, people are posting weird experiments they've been doing. Uh, you know, all the journals, a lot of the journals are are fairly underreported. So, I found lots of great stories there. I could, we could report a hundred interesting stories a day, and we just don't have the time and resources to be able to do it. So, you know, if you are able to kind of get a nose for finding stories, and you're able to communicate those stories well to an audience. Then, then that's all we as a publisher are really looking for. So I highly recommend just get cracking, get writing. In fact, I ranted about this on <laughs> Google Plus a, a couple of weeks ago because I get these emails from people who want to be interns for Universe Today, and I always say, well, you know, I really appreciate that, but I, you know, there's no way I would let a person intern with us because you know, instead of just working for free for me, work for free for yourself. <laughs> You know, there's so many great outlets, so many great places out there that you can you know, you can write and 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 build your own brand and reputation. And then, you know, instead, you know, if if you've written a great article that you're really proud of, drop me an email, drop Phil Plate an email, drop Pamela an email, Ian O'Neill, all you know, we're all one big community of you space guys. You guys writers. rolled me in. I yeah. Was a little grad student, you know, boop, 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 typing away in, in my free time, and uh, you guys mentored me and, and pulled me into the fold, and uh, that, that meant a lot to me and to building this brand new career for myself. Yeah, and we're happy to retweet you, and we're happy to, you know, and to, to make a mention of your article and, and help you build your brand. If you're, you know, if you're serious and you really want to be do this as a career, and you write and you can really sort of show that this is what you want to do, we all love it. And we all want to help you build your career in this as well. And uh, you know, Amy Sure Title is a great example. She is, you know, the hardest working. Uh, I'd say the hardest working uh, space journalist I know of, and the biggest space nerd. And we, uh, you know, we promote what she's working on all the time. If you do something original and interesting, we love it, and we're all happy to help you out. And all you have to do is just drop us an email or drop us a tweet and say, "Hey, I just did this thing that I'm really proud of." And we know we, we can tell right away if it's unique and interesting and and you know you know you're moving into new ground and we're happy to help you get the word out and happy happy to help you build your career. So that's all I got to say about that. There's also the Carnival of Space where uh, mm -hmm. you can just submit your links every week. It's this rotating carnival lands on a different space blog every week. Yeah, and, we made a machine uh, for this. <laughs> yeah, we made a machine that that well, you know tries to help get the word out about as much new space journalism that's going on and try and really build the careers of of everybody. So yeah, absolutely. And then we got the weekly space hangout, which you know we're always looking for new people to come in and and uh, you know discuss some space news, and we'll help you there too. So so absolutely. I mean. You know, I hope you get you 
you get the impression that there is a really vibrant community here and we all want to help each other out and all you have to do is let us know that you exist because <laughs> we're not going to find you otherwise you know you've yeah. got to reach out to us and say hey you know here's what I'm working on here's my blog here's what I've written by the way I don't think anybody's gotten this could you make a note of it and then you know if it is if it, then we're happy to help this is something that Ed Young Ed Young does on his blog as well for any science journalist uh, is that he picks uh, people I think oh I can't remember what the column is it's like science writing I'd pay for you know and, he, and it's uh, I think he yeah. shares the proceeds of, of the blog um, I'm also uh, Minda Berbeco I see you commenting we've sent you emails with the link we've sent you the invite so check your notifications check your email uh, we are waiting for you to come on in have you got comments to share with me Nicole uh, I can do that so we are sharing the YouTube we'll close the door 47 sources. <laughs> wow. Uh, but basically, it's the event page and the YouTube stream and a whole bunch of people who've shared it in the 25 hours since we've been going. So, uh, but but the, the active ones are the YouTube stream and the event page. So I've just shared that with you, Fraser, or with everybody watching or in the Hangout. Um, well, we we just wanted to say thank you to all the people and all the questions and, uh, you know, keep going. And feel free to hassle us if you have questions about all Doom stuff. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. All right, bye, guys. Uh, yeah, I'll make sure. Bug me and make sure that I send my Alma pictures to Pamela. Like I said, I was embarrassed because I, I don't think they came out that well, but I will. Do, I will do that. <laughs> I want to see them. I, 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 like I said, I wish I was there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was good. Uh, while they're setting.